This is the Truth Be Told podcast, where we unlock the secrets of strategic communication. Welcome to this episode of the Truth Be Told podcast. I am Dave Thompson, your host, and today I'm bringing you our guest, Jamana Kid, for part two of our series. In part one, we learned a lot about Jamana and her experience in the journalism industry. And today in part two, we're going to learn what her experience was like being the victim of a financial scam and identity theft crime. Thanks for listening. But uh, for for our listeners, I know after you get divorced and, and you're kind of setting up your, your next steps and you go to look for some support from a kind of a, an assistant and I'll let you d- describe what you were looking for yeah. and what you found. Yeah. And then this woman um, ends up being a, a con artist. So w- walk us through, I guess, how that first started or yeah. what the, what so, the I mean, in a nutshell, I actually was um, moving from New Jersey to California and I suddenly learned that I had breast cancer and I almost didn't move, but you know, things kind of fell into place and it worked out where I could still move here. Um, but I'd have to start treatment as soon as I got here. And, uh, I didn't know what that entailed. I didn't know, you know, how my body was going to react, how tired I was going to be, you know, my children were old enough where they didn't need babysitters, but no one was driving yet, you know? So I still needed like transportation help, you know, just, I needed assistance, but nothing like, crazy corporate and like, not like a, you know, administrative, but just kind of more of like, you know, helping, you know, like home management and helping with the kids and mm-hmm. stuff. So I, I, I got a referral from someone like really trustworthy who again, had no idea. They just kind of went on, you know, based on hearsay on their end and they connected me with her. And when I met her, I kind of thought, Oh, you're totally overqualified for this. Um, she spoke Mandarin and, you know, uh, French and she just had this like, you know, great resume and she was like a, a, you know, a businesswoman. She owned uh, a concierge service and I was like, okay, wait, yeah, no, you definitely, this isn't for you, but we connected as far as, you know, oh, I had this horrible divorce and I read all about your divorce and I hate that you went through what you went, you know, and she just seemed really nice. And she um, kind of was like, I'm going to work something out. Like I'll figure, you know, I, I can, I want to help you. And, and I really thought at the time, like there is no way that I, that's not what I'm looking for. Like I, but then when we talked numbers, she kind of made it sound like, well, you know, I have a daughter who's just turning, I want to say she's like turning 20 at the time, or she was like, so she can do a lot of the running around and pickups and drop offs. And so then it kind of starts to make sense. And I'm like, oh, I see. She's kind of trying to set her daughter up for this. And this is perfect. Like I could really see her daughter doing, you know, this is exactly what I'm looking for. But um, so where she got me was, I, I actually am pretty good about doing background checks and, you know, you know, protecting and, you know, being confidential and, you know, signing, you know, even like, what are those, where, what are those, um, Jason used to have people sign them. An NDA? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I've been yeah. around that, so I understand, yeah. you know, but um, where she got me was, you know, she was just good. She was a professional and I didn't know it, obviously, but she just said, listen, you don't know how you're going to respond, you know, and you seem like, you know, you're strong person, you're independent, your kids are grown. So you don't know how long you're going to need me, you know? So I have a concierge service. Why don't you just, you know, like let the the um, company, Elite Lux Life, just invoice you once a month. And that way, it, it just like we offer other services, we could offer assistance, you know? So this is the price that we agree on. And then you'll just get an invoice once a month from Elite Lux Life. And that way, when you're, you know, you're like, oh, we don't, you know, I'm good, whatever, then we just terminate that rather than, you know, an employee and having to deal with like, you know, uh, benefits and health insurance and whatever. So I was like, I I called my financial people. Everyone was like, yeah, that seems fine. You know, makes sense, whatever. So that's where she got me. Because if, if, you know, if I knew then what I know now, I would have been like, yeah, I was still doing a background check on you. (laughs) Where's your driver's license? Well, that's kind of I would, how you got there. 
Mm-hmm. I looked and- at the um, the company mm-hmm. itself because I thought when you talk about your back, the kind of the due diligence, and she even had like um, I don't know, she had like videos or like a oh, YouTube clip or whatever was- to make. She was renting homes and cars to people. Like I ended up talking to the, her her clients. She had a she had a big clientele. You know, um, she whether she was also stealing their credit cards, whether she was overcharging, and I'm sure there was something dishonest in it, but she really did have a, a, a concierge service. Yeah. Um, and she, it seemed like her intent or what, when I heard her do some interviews, which we can talk about, but it's almost like she wanted to um, portray that she was living this lavish lifestyle so that her clients would feel like, Hey, we're on the same, we're in the same space. Yeah. So I and, I think that's, yeah. and again, hindsight is 2020, but when she was first getting to know me, I think back to like a lot of things she would do to try to impress me. Like, you know, like, Hey, I'm a season ticket holder to the, you know, uh, the Lakers come with me to a game. And I'm like, the last thing I want to do is go to another basketball game. Right. Right. And, you know, and I think I went once to be polite and she could tell I was just not, a, you know, I was kind of like, Oh, this was fun. You know, whatever. Um, she was, she was just, she put feelers out, you know, like my car would go into the shop. Like, oh, take, take the ghost. Um, you know, it'll be fine. And I'm like, there is no way I'm driving that. No, thanks. Yeah. Like I would <laughs> rather get the freaking you know, whatever rental from the, the car, you know, the shop that I, you know, I don't worry about. Um, so she kind of was like, Hey, that, that's not her interest kid. That's not it that, you know, and then she finally kind of realized it was my kids. She kind of saw that that's when I lit anything, anyone wants to help my kids. Like I'm worried about this kid or that, you know, so then that's kind of where we connected, where she kind of like would be a support to me. As a single mom, you know, you're always looking for that support, you know, someone to care, someone to be like, let's go research the school. Let's go. You know what I mean? So I, I feel like that's where she really kind of built the most trust. Um, and, you know, in hindsight, looking back at it, it's kind of like, you know, she would full access to my home. Like, you know, she kind of gradually grew into my life, you know, like next thing you know, it's like, oh, I'm out of town. Don't worry. I'll go by, pick up the mail. I'll do this. I'll do that, you know. And so now this person's taking the mail and bringing it into your home for you. This person is in my office um, when I'm out of town. This person has access. And, and I'm you know, fairly trusting when I get to know someone as far as like, you know, um, not, not feeling like, oh crap, she saw this, let me change that password or, you know, and then she was like, she did little things that made me build trust. Like, I just remember one time being on hold with like the phone company or something. And I was like, here, I got to run, just take whatever. And she's like, okay, but I'm, I'm gonna, um, say that I'm your assistant and they might have to like authorize you to talk to me. And I remember thinking, Okay, rule follower Sally, you know, like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and it was right. like so minor, you know. Yeah, so, so it was little. Uh, it was kind of minor fate, minor um, right. But I was favors like, wow, or intrusion. Trust yeah. me, yeah. Like she's better yeah. than me. I would have <laughs> yeah. just said it was you, you know, <laughs> yeah. just like questioning so, on my phone bill. So then, how long from as she's kind of growing and embedding and embedded into your life, and you're obviously naturally trusting a little bit more as that process is growing, yeah. And then, from from our conversations before, I know you started to get kind of some calls from your your financial people of yeah. So so my financial guy, you know, but he he's the guy that his he he would normally do this. So it wasn't like it just started, you know. He's right. the guy that's like on, on top of it, like you know, as far as like you're spending too much, you need to tone it down. Like this happened back in New Jersey, you know, where I would meet with him and we would look at things, and he'd be like, this this this, you know. So it wasn't like completely alarming, but he was consistent. He was like, you're overspending, you're overspending. And I'm like, dude, I don't know what else to do. Like, I, I, I know that maybe moving to LA, just, you know, weather is nicer. We're out more. I don't know what, like, I couldn't pinpoint it. And finally one day he called and he was just like, like, it's not even like you to have multiple credit cards. I'm like, I don't have multiple credit cards. He's like, you need to look into it or whatever. So I was like, okay, I need to look into everything. So I start looking and um, it shows, oh, oh no, he, he, I think he messaged me and he was like, like, there's a chase card. Um, You need to like, look, t- tell me what this chase card is. So I, I think I was on the phone with Tracy or I don't remember how, but we we're talking and I'm just not even accusing her. I'm just saying like, so weird. You know, Ron keeps saying I'm overspending, I'm overspending. He said something about a chase card. 
I don't have a chase card. And she was like, you know what? Remember we did talk about maybe opening a card so that um, when TJ starts college, it's easier to just use one credit card for the expenses. So you have the 529 reimburse you because 529 takes forever. And and I was like, yeah, I do remember us talking about that, but I don't know. We hang up the phone and I'm still kind of like, I got to get to the bottom of this. That's weird. But for some reason, not like really thinking, like maybe he saw something like, I don't know. 20 minutes later, she's at my door and she's like bawling, crying. And here's where she got me a second time. <laughs> um, you know, bawling, crying, uh, just, you know, it's, I'm a horrible person. You have to understand it's so hard being married to Daryl. He's so much younger than me and he loves nice things. And I just got to a point where I felt like I was losing him and you need to just call the cops. You need to turn me in, I, you know, when you were out of town, I was bringing your mail in and you had a pre-approved card, which I also kind of thought, do they do you don't get pre-approved? But then I was like, I don't know, you know, because I'm not right. a person really. And so she was like, yeah, you had a pre-approved card. I was like, I'm just going to use this to get out of this debt and then I'm going to pay her back. And, you know, and I mean, I remember my stomach was like, oh my God, like, who are you? Like, I really trusted you. And like, this right. is, you know, but then I'm just kind of like, distracted by this person literally saying, I've been trying to take my life for the past several months since I did this and you need to call the cops. And, and then, you know, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I, I did feel bad for, I felt like you're not a bad person. Everything you've showed me in the last several years, like, I like you, you're, you know, you seem like a good person, you know, like I, this is so, it's not like I, you know, suspected or saw things like, you know what I mean? Like I, I was really blown away by this person who I actually really liked. Um, and then I also heard lots of horror stories in the past when people have gotten um, money stolen from them that you never get it back. So right. I kind of thought, okay, well, I'm going to be smart. I can turn you in and I'll never get a red cent back, or I can work a deal with you. You pay me back this money, you know, and then, after you've paid it back or whatever, like, I don't need to ever talk to you again. So I kind of thought that was an advantage. And I we even like drew out an agreement. And even through that, she would keep saying like, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this grace. You're such a good Christian. And you know, and I'm just like, you need to be like, I was counseling her. Like, I was like, you need to be like, you know, nicer to yourself. Like, you know, we all make mistakes. You're not a bad person. You made a horrible decision, but look, you're paying me back. And, and she was like every week she was like, here's 5,000, here's 3,000. It was like chunks, you know? And, um, and then I would get like an email, like in the middle of the night, it would be like this long letter of just like, you know, I just can't stop thinking of how you are an angel in my life and how if this would have happened with anyone else, I'd be behind bars yet you saw the good in me. Like, it was like a lot. Like I remember it was like draining where I was like, you know, but, yeah. um, never sat yeah. with my spirit though, even though like, I remember telling Ron, you know, it, at Morgan Stanley, I was like, yeah, no, no, don't worry. I figured it out, whatever. And he was like, all right, well, you need to chill, whatever. Yeah. And, um, and then she was giving me the money. I was tallying it. Um, I had to take my car to the shop this time. I was like, okay, fine. Yeah, I'll take the G wagon and use <laughs> that for the, you know, month and a half that I won't have my car. I was like rooting for her. I was like, that way I could like, whatever you would charge for the G wagon, I can like add that. Like I was trying to get the number up for her. Like I wanted okay. it to, you know, and, um, and it just never sat well, whatever. And then um, I'm like a super spiritual person. And so I was talking to someone and she's kind of like, a, like, you know, very spiritual and we're talking about it. And I said, I've never told anyone this. I don't even know why I'm telling you, but this happened with my assistant. And she was like, you need to, you know, and I'm like, no, I already gave her my word. I'm not going to turn her in. Um, no, you need to like, you know, look into this. It's bigger than what it is. Blah, 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 you know, and I remember just like hanging up with her and being like, you're crazy. And I don't need to do anything, whatever. Prayed, 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 woke up the next morning and just like clear as day. I was like, called my financial guy. I'm like, Remember when you told me about that credit card? Well, you know, I, this is what I found out it really was. And he was like, okay, we need to figure out what else. I'm like, no, that's it. I just 
haven't told you and I've been holding on to it, but she's been paying me back, blah, blah, blah. And he was just like, it can't just be it. Um, we need to take a deep dive. Yeah. And the first thing I did was I said, okay, so I, he's like, you got to cut her off done. Forget her paying me everything. So I did. I remember her texting me a ton that day and I wasn't responding and she knew she was just like, so are you firing me? And I just like, didn't respond. But I remember calling the apartment complex that um, we were trying to get my my girls their first apartment. And I called and said, you know, hey, I know you've been dealing with my personal assistant, but, you know, I just been dealing with this fraud situation with her. So, um, you know, long, she's no longer a contact. Um, you can just, you know, talk to me directly. And they were like, well, you were denied for the apartment. And I'm like, why? And they said, well, because your credit score is like 400. Or they, well, they just said that they just said because of your credit score. Right, and I was like, yeah. What? Like I pride myself <laughs> having like perfect credit. So I log on to see my my credit report, and that's where I kind of just saw everything. And right. my credit score is four hundred. And so at, at that point, did you do you remember? Because I know it's about to get much bigger. At that mm -hmm. point, any idea how much money you think was stolen from you or fraudulently charged? Mm -mm. At that point. At that point, I didn't know. Yeah. At that point, I knew that there was like obviously some like identity theft happening. Um, I didn't know. I, I didn't know because there's there's two different things. There's opening credit cards with my name and spending, and then there's the actual funneling of money missing from me. So that was the tough part, I think, um, because. A, the, the, okay, so the it's so complicated. I mean, it took forever to figure out, but I mean, it looked like Quantico in here. Like I had, right. I, I, I printed out every single text from the first day I met her. And what I did is I just connected the texts to the bills to the, you know what I mean? Like I, it was just like a, a like big game of connect the dots and then I can just figure everything out. But um, yeah, so one one really helpful thing that happened and you probably can understand this kind of your field is that i called bank of america and i said you know hey i need to um close so when i found out about the first credit card i just changed all my passwords i didn't like think anything i just yeah just in case you know i don't trust this girl anymore right but now i called and said i need to close my accounts and they asked me why and i told them and i just happened to get a really cool operator that day because he said, okay, I'm closing the checking, I'm closing the savings, I'm closing your credit card. And I and I was like, okay. And he was like, what about the other accounts? And I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm logged on to my account. I'm like, that's all I have. And he was like, um, no, you you have another savings, another checking and two other credit cards. And I'm like, um, I'm, I'm logged on to the account. And he said, I think what your assistant did is she created it where she's the main account holder and you have limited access. Uh, your heart sinks at that moment. Well, but after dealing with everything for the year or two years, I, he never should have told me that. Like right. the way that they operate, right? they don't give you info. They don't, you know what I mean? Like it becomes a guessing game and you know, you're treated like the criminal and they're trying to, you know, I just like, God sent me the greatest, you know, right. Uh, you know, Bank of America operator that day. Right. Yeah. As, um, and then, so then he, and then he told me what I need to do to, you know, become the main account holder again, whatever. And then once I got, a, you know, a hold of those, then I got printouts and saw the, the way that it worked. So what she was doing was, um, and then I, just for safety, I remember being on the phone with the guy from Morgan Stanley. And he said, you know, just to be safe, let's call 529 and make sure that we change all the password and put like a double security on it. That if anyone right. calls, they have to have Morgan Stanley on the phone. So I'm like, this okay. Is, yeah. This is for the college savings account. Mm -hmm. That's right. Like, okay. Yeah. And I remember even thinking like, this is excessive, but you know what? Yeah. Why not? Right. right. So I call them. And again, awesome operator. She says, um, your accounts have been active since 20. 15 and i'm like no I, I never even log on i don't even like I, I don't touch those accounts yet you know my kids weren't actively like using right. the you know their college money yet 
And so she said, yeah, they have. And so then she gave me printouts. So it took, you know, it took us some figuring out, but what she was doing was she, and then at this point, I didn't know how she had the full access. I didn't know how she was able to, you know, do this, but she had opened accounts at Bank of America. She had, would occasionally wire money from Morgan Stanley into those accounts. Morgan Stanley didn't think anything was wrong with that because I do have Bank of, Bank of America accounts and it was in my name. And then right. simultaneously, she was moving money from the 529 into those accounts. She was also paying minimum on the credit cards she opened from those accounts. So when I'm telling Bank of America, these credit cards are fraud, they're saying, no, they're not. They're being paid from an account in your name. And I'm like, I didn't create that account. That account's fraud too. Like, so it was just, it, it's a circus. It was so crazy. And I still was like, I felt like there was a missing link, you know, like, how do you get full access like that? Like, I have right. a hard time even getting information and it's really me. And uh, it was a slip up by another Bank of America um, person on the phone where I'm going back and forth with them. I'm told them, I, you know, I've, I've reported this a million times. You can't find the, you know, the tracking number. They're moving me from, you know, department to department. Like this was like my full time job for, you know, a, a solid year. And I get sent to this one department and the lady says something about um, the power of attorney that was signed. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I just signed a power of attorney. And then you could tell she was kind of like, well, uh, 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 you know, and I'm like, OK, so I got to get on this. So I finally get a copy of that. And we contact the guy, the um, notary, and he checks in the book and he's like, you did sign a notary that day, but it wasn't a power of attorney. You signed wow. and he showed me what it was. And what, what she did was she slipped one of the documents for the power of attorney that needs my full signature in there. And so I signed it and then she forged all the other pages with just the initials. And once they showed it to me, the initials were obviously forged. Yeah. Um, and then a lot more made sense because it was like, how could she have this access, you know, that she had. Right. So, you know, it, then it became scary. It was like, what was this woman's end game? Because, you know, my, my credit score is at 400. You're draining the, the college funds. Like, you know that you're going to be busted out any second. And then when you trace back from the day that I gave her that second chance to this day, she like accelerated, like her spending mm -hmm. probably doubled. Like yeah. she knew, uh oh, my time's almost up. What what was she using the money for? Was it what? What wasn't she using it for? Yeah. This girl had returns on some of the credit cards, like purchase at Macy's and then a return. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't even wrap my brain around like what right. she was doing, how she was living. Yeah. yeah. That's unbelievable. I remember um, we talked before, I know some of the things that she was either purchasing or spending on entertainment or whatever, she was almost trying to mirror things that might look normal, I guess, if you were looking at a kind of a high level of your spending. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I don't, there were so many, there were so many parallels that we drew, um, you know, I, I mean, and, and it was disgusting. It was really hard to see, but like I paid for her wedding. I paid for um her bachelorette party i paid for like you just saw it. i i i helped open the restaurant which i still don't get how our system works because there's proof right. that i helped open that restaurant yet she's still running that restaurant they're still making money on that restaurant right. her husband is still living in a home on the lake in scottsdale and paying like eight or nine thousand dollars a month for rent yet i haven't been paid a cent back from, yeah. Well, and that's the, the part is we, I know we got just a few minutes left here and I yeah. wanted to ask you about the experience of having to tell that story. I mean, now you've told it a million times very publicly if you've had to share it, but what I think is always really inspiring from you, from all the stuff we've talked about is you always want to give and, uh, and help people kind of learn from, from your experiences. So if, if people are listening that work for, you know, financial institutions, law enforcement or whatever, there's a lot that goes on here, right? They got to talk to you. one, one piece I would like you to kind of discuss is your sense of urgency, maybe what versus what an investigator's sense of urgency was and how, 
you know, we both know one of the one of the investigators who's an incredible, incredible person, um, Dana Alessandro. So if you can kind of just describe what that looked like, I guess, the urgency piece. Um, I think that, you know, it's your life. It's like the most like traumatic thing that like, I, I mean, if I could tell you the number of like DMs and emails I get after people watch the documentaries, like, I am so sorry. Like, I, it burns me that you went through this. And you know, because they got to live it through me, through a documentary. But yeah. I think that most, you know, detectives and most, you know, people working in the banks, whatever, you know, it's just another day, another case, another story. And so I think that it's a, it's an actual skill to have to, and, and I would, I mean, I'm telling you, like, we both love Dan. He's amazing. And right. I, I would catch him doing it. I would catch him being like, da, 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 like, don't worry. And then he'd like be like, okay, so this is this is what we're gonna do. You know, like where I, I was like, oh my gosh, bless his heart. He's trying so hard to care about this. And not that he didn't care about it, but first of all, I was like in the southern district. Like my case had to have been sandwiched between like the cartel and like Trump or something. And then we right. got like me, you know, like hey, I just found out that Tracy moved. Did you see that they has a new address? You know, and so I think that he did such a great job of you know, keeping me calm, making me feel that it was important. Like I said, even at times where I could tell, like, I'm kind of like, you want to block my number. I know you do. Right. <laughs> but, you right. know, he would just always find his patience and, and, and kind of just always make me feel like, you know, th this is important. I haven't forgotten about you. It's a long process. And, um, you know, and then I, I feel like I have a relationship with this guy, like, because I can even like start sensing, like when I got him at a good time or when I didn't, or when things, you know, I, right. I started like seeing and his he, pattern. He had you start, he had you start journaling things. I remember, well, that was right? the best when, yeah, I think I, cause every day I was, cause I was on it. When I was telling you, I was like PI of the year. I would be like, just <laughs> changed, you know, they just moved their address. They just like fired X amount of employees. This employee's pissed off because they didn't pay him. She's paying the bouncers on Zoe. Like I was like on it because she hasn't been arrested yet. And he was like, I have an idea. You should just start journaling. And just like every time you think it's just write it down. And I was like, he is really trying to like, you know, right. but I journaled and it helped. Yeah. <laughs> and when well, it was great time, documentation. Like, that you do have to like advocate for yourself. Like at the end of the day, yeah. no one's ever going to care about anything as much as you yeah. care. You know, like that's yeah. just human nature. But I do think that it sucked dealing with different people who, did. and I, you can cut this out if I'm, you know, but the DA who had the case, I feel like he could have given a one crap, even to the point where we presented all this evidence and the judge said, oh, wow, do you think she should have more time? And he said, no, I think whatever they gave her is fine. Like, whose side yeah. are you on? Yeah. Like, and, and I know that there's different, like, you know, avenues and it's political and whatever. But at the end of the day, I was like, that that's a sucky feeling. And then when I asked him, you know, what about all the insurance fraud? I always thought that's where she was going to get hit the hardest because she she was using my my health insurance. She was, you, you know, and he said, yeah, it was just too complicated. Hmm. So it was like too much well paperwork. When, when you say that, and I, I think about, you know, you're a victim in this, in this case, and you got victims and everything from, you know, sexual assault cases and rape and financial crime, sexual harassment, discrimination, whatever it may be. Yeah. There's a lot that comes um, to the unfortunate responsibility, I guess, of a victim of they have to almost advocate for themselves, like you mentioned, and sometimes deal with shame, guilt, embarrassment, fear, yeah. and how, how can an interviewer handle that better? I mean, did you have, did you have positive experiences where people kind of yeah. empathized with that? You know, it, it's kind of crazy, but it, as silly as it sounds, but getting that one person who just says, oh man, I'm really sorry you have to go through that. Like just that, like that simple enough made you feel like, oh, and then she did this da, 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 and you feel, you know what I mean? Where, right. cause yeah, there, there's the part of me who is like, okay, I feel so dumb. People are going to be like, how did you have someone work for you? Who did, how did you not notice that much money missing? How did you not, you know, so you're, you're, you're already projecting that. So the last right. thing you need is to be talking to someone. There was a guy right across the street here at Chase Bank. I remember walking in and, you know, because 
Bank of America, I had to do all on the phone, but Chase, I just walked in and he was like, oh, this sucks. Wait. And it was like the coolest guy. Like you just made me feel like the issue at hand was I got taken, not, yeah. you know, how was I careless or, you know, well, you got to go do all of this first. And we, you know, like, it's just, it's, it's so simple. It's just like a little empathy that yeah. goes such a long way. Yeah. I think that's a huge takeaway for people. I mean, that the yeah. first utterance out of an interviewer, you know, when, when they talk to somebody who's dealt with that can set the tone for the entire relationship of what that's yeah. going to, that's going to look like. Yeah, so what was, what was the, um, the end of all of this? What did it look like? The total financial impact was. Gosh, um, I want to say that the financial impact was close to $3 million, Yeah. but I was able to recover 600 back from Morgan Stanley, which was nice. Yeah. Um, the money that she was paying me back that I thought was, was from my own money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that kind of got erased. Um, I think that that was another thing that kind of like really bummed me out is that her plea deal was that she is supposed to pay me back like 1.3, pay the government back 1.3. And, but if you were to calculate it, she owes me close to two. Yeah. And um, for whatever reason, they just, you know, didn't want to do the paperwork for some stuff or whatever. I don't know yeah. how it works, but they came up with that number and then they don't. Um, and then that's it. Like they don't, um, uh, like they don't make sure she does. They don't follow up with it. No one's ever, you know, reached out about that. And even like she writes about it in her blog, she makes like, I don't know, 10 cents an hour or something in jail. And she, she writes that it goes to restitution. But the thing about her is that she has a $400,000 restitution that she owes from a previous felony. So I'm still confused on how you get a plea deal when you have a, previous felony yeah. that you never made good on. Yeah. Well, I think it's also interesting, the complexity of this case. I mean, think about all the resources and your intelligent person you're doing. I'm picturing you with the, the uh, like yarns and, and tacks on your no wall idea. trying to track it was, everything. It was, it was nuts. <laughs> you just think about how complex that is. And not only for, you know, lay people to figure out what, what just happened to me, but also and investigators and prosecutors and the, those that aren't specialized in financial crime, it's almost like, you, you know, you got to educate them on what happened and you need all these different people to be communicating to each other. And I think that um, was the tough part is I feel like we did all of that. Like we did all yeah. of the, the paperwork. Like we, I even kind of regret it now, but I don't know, it may have been good, but I had a firm that worked with me to put together a whole like package so that way they had everything and they, you know, yeah. and I, I want to say, and, and that's where Dan, Dan's awesome. Like I could tell when he was disappointed with some of the outcomes, but he has to keep it politically correct. You know what I mean? Cause he'll right. be like really adamant, like this is going to happen. And then when it doesn't, he's like, yeah, I know sometimes this is what happened, you know, but I could tell like inside he's probably like, that was some BS. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, well, I think um, to wrap us up, I'm, I want to, well, thank you for your time. And I think sure. if we kind of tie a lot of this together, it's really interesting that, you know, we talked about you hosting interviews on a red carpet, and then we yeah. went to talk about you having to deal with this ridiculous identity fraud, financial kind of crime, but this commonality of perspective and empathy and people matter, I think is, is important. And so I want, I want to read something real quick to you that you shared with me, actually. And this was somebody, I think, sent this or posted about about you and your experience and then ask if you just had anything else that you wanted to kind of leave, leave people with but mm -hmm. this is a, a comment sent to you that said uh, watched your watched your hulu episode episode yesterday and couldn't stop thinking about it during my morning run i'm so blown away by the grace you displayed toward the horrific situation uh tracy inflicted upon you and your family as someone who's also been conned i just assumed that anger distrust and all-consuming shame are my new reality but your display of strength Self-compassion and peace has awoken an ache to seek help in order to reclaim the person I, I was before all this happened. No words to properly express how impactful that is, but thank you so much for sharing your story. And I, I just thought that was just so so touching and powerful. And um, I think just for everything that you've dealt with in your life, it's been helpful for, for you to share it in these different different avenues, and especially with us, because I know a lot of people can take away you know, how to be better 
communicators, interviewers, and have some empathy. So thank you for that. But I'll, I'll leave it to you if there's any any parting words you want people to know on how to be better people, how to be better communicators. Um, yeah. Wow. I mean, just, you know, hearing that it's like, that's what makes it worth it. Cause it's not easy. It's not easy for a victim of anything to speak out about, you know, because, you know, it's a shame that no one can even realize, like, you know, there's so many people who are like, why would you be ashamed? You know, where it's, we, you, you can't help yourself if you're ashamed about something or if you feel, you know, a certain way. So I think that, you know, it's something our world, our whole world needs is yeah. just to, um, you know, stop and put yourself in people's shoes and to, you know, be realistic in a sense of it's, things are so much easier said than done. And, you know, it, it's almost like the, the thing with road rage, whenever someone like sits on their horn, I'm like, what if that was your mom or like your grandmother and someone just did that, you know, like, right. then all of a sudden it's okay for them to make a mistake, you know, like it's just to kind of put things in perspective and not just, you know, you know, assume that everyone is wired like you or, you know, as tough as you or whatever. So I think that empathy just, I, I can't speak enough about empathy, not, yeah. not even sympathy. No one's saying, feel sorry for the person cry with them. No, just, just understand, you know, yeah. and that's huge. Yeah. I think that's a great takeaway. If we were all judged in our worst moments, we'd be in a pretty, a pretty oh, sad boy. place. So. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so that's, that's helpful. And that's a great takeaway. And I, I appreciate all your time today and all the conversations we've had. And, and, uh, thank you for being transparent and providing perspective to people. So it's definitely, definitely helpful. Oh, it's awesome. Thank you. It was my honor. (laughs) I'll let you get back to your rainy California and um, we'll pretend that next year you're going to be a Buffalo Bills fan. Uh, but I won't hold, I won't hold that against you. Listen, because that's where you're from. It's on my yeah. list. <laughs> Loyalty. <laughs> well, thanks, Jamana. It was a pleasure thanks. having you. And thank you all for listening to this episode of the Truth Be Told podcast. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And to keep this conversation going, follow the Truth Be Told podcast on LinkedIn and Truth Be Told CFI on Twitter. On behalf of the International Association of Interviewers, Rick Landers Zalowski and our valued sponsors, thank you for joining us on this episode of the Truth Be Told Podcast.